Hi, everyone. I, I'm James Howard. I, um, very briefly, since, since that's actually a very good question, my background is in public policy, and, and I claim to be an economist, even though I'm not, because it's easier than explaining what I actually do. Um, and uh, last year, I gave a talk here about, um, in the room across the hall, about uh, the problems, of, well, it wasn't problems per se, but my expectations of what would happen as people started landing on Mars and started forming their own governments, how things would happen and how things would evolve. And at the very end of that talk, in the last slide, there's that whole, you know, then this is what happens next kind of thing, where I made references to um, a couple of economic problems, and about 15 minutes afterwards, I go, oh dear. That's a whole other set of talks. So <clears throat> I'm here to talk about the economics of Martian infrastructure. This is not the economics of getting to Mars. It's the economics of what happens once people <coughs> are there. So um, in a rather odd way, um, you know, infrastructure, basically stuff like communications, bridges, highways, uh, you know, that kind of stuff, right? Um, and I've stolen all my pictures here from Futurama because it seemed, I was gonna do The Simpsons, I'm like, oh wait, no, Futurama's better for this. Um, and I'm gonna begin with an interlude, and I promise this is not an advertisement, it just sounds like one. So, <clears throat> back in 2001, I was working for a small telecommunications company, a small satellite communications company called Wavex, and it would go bankrupt after about a year. But we were building these small email uh, satellite system, a satellite system for sending email to places where you couldn't get a, a line in. <coughs> and one of the problems we were doing, or one of the things we heard, is that NASA was putting out its second round of discovery um, requests for proposals for the discovery projects. And they did everything but stamp in giant letters on it, Mars or bus. They really wanted stuff to go to Mars. And, you know, we're not, I mean, we had people there who were research scientists, but we were there building communications infrastructure. And I said, well, you know what? We should come back and say, look, we realize that this doesn't fit into with the, the scope of your project, but you guys need infrastructure when you get there. You need to be able to backbone communications back to Earth. And you know what? If we're going to put a satellite constellation in orbit around Mars, it should also provide positioning information, right? This, uh, this all makes sense. I, and I'm not claiming to be an evil genius or anything who cook this up, but it, it makes sense. And then a couple of months, a couple of years later, I ended up seeing a memo. Somebody at NASA said essentially the same thing. I mean, we never went anywhere with that, but because we went bankrupt and then had other problems. Um, but then there was a, a memo that came out of NASA saying exactly the same thing. We need to put in communications backbones. And you know, while we're building a satellite communications constellation, it's not that much more difficult to put in, you know, a Martian equivalent of GPS. So, anyway, I had told a friend the story many years ago, and then in 2014, NASA puts out an RFP saying, hi, tell us how you would build a communications infrastructure for Mars. And he forwards this to me and says, hey, didn't you do something with this once? And I'm like, oh, this sounds like fun. <laughs> so <laughs> so I, I get together, um, a crew of misfits. None of us are actually qualified to be working on this project, and we and, and we come back with a response to the <coughs> RFI. Um, we we came back and said, "You need three things: you need communications infrastructure. This is what it looks like. Also, since we're in the neighborhood, let's build uh, a positioning system, and you need a governance structure to support this. That thing about the governance structure is what led to my talk last year, and of course, for reasons, we ended up calling this Union Aerospace Corporation. <laughs> <laughs> so." <laughs> Um, we never heard back from NASA. I suppose nobody else ever did either. But um, it was fun and it was entertaining. We spent a couple hundred bucks pranking NASA, essentially. Uh, <laughs> you know, like I said, for reasons. Um, but there's actually important stuff here. The technology of putting together, um, somebody's alarming. Uh, <laughs> the technology of putting together a positioning system with a, uh, with a telecommunication system is not complicated. You need another transmitter and a very precise clock, and you're already going to need that very precise clock anyway just to manage a telecommunications infrastructure. The economics of this, though, are fascinating. So that's what we're here to talk about. And I told you, as I said, they're all Futurama graphics. Um, and for some people who, who've had a lot of econ background, this is going to be like you know, a review of like Econ 201. Um, but there's some stuff here that I often hear misquoted in other contexts here on Earth, and, and I want to talk about this and give this a full background so we can see where this is going. 
when it comes to measuring goods and services, we have two ways of two two dimensions we characterize these things on. One is whether or not they're excludable. If I'm using it, if I'm selling you something, can I not sell it to you at the same time? And then the other one is uh, uh, rivalry. If you're using it, can you also use it at the same time? And these, I know they sound like they're very, the, kind of the same thing, but the real problem we have here is that they're actually just looking at the same question from multiple angles. And it turns out we end up getting a two by two matrix, a typology of goods, leading to four types. Private goods, <coughs> common pool resources, club goods, and everyone's heard public goods, right? So private goods are the things that you buy in stores all the time. Food, clothing, uh, shelter. All right, well, you don't buy that in a store typically, but I mean, you're, I mean, you can buy a tent, but that's not my point. I mean, those are the basic things that we consider private goods. They're scarce, and they're defined by their scarcity. And they're sold right up to the market level where we want them. And, you know, some people may not be able to afford things, but that's a different question. They're characterized by this basic idea that um, you buy it, you use it, you tend not to let anyone else use it at the same time. Um, when I'm teaching public finance, because like, like I said, I teach policy and econ. Uh, when I teach public finance, my favorite example is a cheeseburger. Once I'm done with it, you don't want it. <laughs> um, and, and, and that really kind of nails the point home for a lot of my students. The second type, and we're just kind of going across that matrix, across the top, are common pool resources. Things that are common pool resources are things like fisheries. Fisheries are the classic example um, because there's no way to, I mean, you go in, you use the fish, right? You, you can pull the fish out. Nobody else can get those fish since you fished them, but there's no fence around it to keep anyone out. So it's not excludable, but it is rivalrous. And I also use Chesapeake blue crabs as an example here because I live in Maryland. This is, you know, crab country. Um, the other things that are included in this are things like atmosphere. Not air, and this is different, but the existence of the atmosphere around us. This is something that we all use, we can all share, and we can't turn it off. Waterways uh, for the purposes of travel are another great example of this. Um, these tend to end up getting uh, arranged, uh, what's the word I'm looking for here? Um, uh, licensed for use, right? So you go out, if you ever want to go get crabs out of the Chesapeake Bay. Who, is anybody here from the area? Okay, good, okay. So you go out <coughs> crabbing over here on the Chesapeake Bay, you know, up to a certain, you know, small amount, you know, you're fine, you don't have to worry about it. But if you're doing it commercially, you need to get a license, right? That license limits how much you can get. Same with a lot of other fishing. Also, uh, telecommunications infrastructure is limited this way. Uh, think of getting uh, FCC li licenses from the FCC for Spectrum. Same exact thing, same process, same economics. Then we have club goods. And this is a place where we can create artificial scarcity by closing the door. Um, we often hear public education referred to as a public good, right? See here, and we'll get to public goods a little bit here in a minute, but education is not a public good. We can close that door. Oh, wait, somebody's closing that door right on cue. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> And now the people outside this room no longer benefit from whatever wisdom I'm up here expounding. <laughs> Work with me here. <laughs> right? Club goods. And, and, and that artificial scarcity is created entirely by the artificial boundary that we've created. But you're listening, you're listening, you're listening, and your listening does not interfere with your enjoyment of whatever I'm saying. Um, and the same for everyone else in the room. Now, this is true right up until we have a congestion problem. Think about a swimming pool that's, you know, got so many people in it, nobody can swim. And so that's usually the classic example of both a, a club good and, that, uh, and, the, and the, uh, the, uh, excuse me, the uh, congestion problem being hit. Other examples are movie theaters, right? You can walk into a movie theater, sit down. Yeah, some seats are better than others, but just work with, you know, it, it, these are idealized models anyway. Um, you sit down, right up until the last seat's taken, everything's cool. Um, what other things do we have here? Satellite television is another place we see artificial scarcity. Remember the, anybody remember back in the 80s having to steal descramblers? 
See, I was, I, I, I was eight years old then. I don't remember that, but I've heard about it. So, <laughs> you know, and, and this is a thing. You know, that's artificial scarcity, and that also creates, you know, people who will rob the system and other things like that because they, of course, say, well, no one's really getting hurt, right? But they're violating the artificial scarcity that makes that work. And this is the thing that happens here. The marginal benefit tends to be, remember marginal benefit from econ, right? And then marginal cost? Marginal cost is the cost of producing the next one. Marginal benefit is how much utility you get from acquiring it. Marginal benefit's linear, right? You're getting satellite TV, right? Everyone's getting, say, $10 worth of value out of it. That's why you're paying $10 for it. I have no idea how much it costs. I had Verizon. So, <laughs> but you, get, you spend $10 a month on it, and presumably you're getting $10 of value and $10 of marginal benefit out of it. But what's the marginal cost of the provider to provide that service to you? Anyone with? Very low, right. It's almost nothing. It's the cost of customer service. It's not the cost of more satellites or more, more bits flying in the air at you. Those bits are coming at you regardless of whether you want them. So you're getting irradiated all the time. So, and I like to scare people with that. So, <laughs> this non-rivalry is a key feature. And this means that we have this very bizarre curve, and I, I didn't actually draw one for this, unfortunately where you have marginal benefit you know, staying linear, and every person gets added in, that margin, the net marginal benefit across society keeps going up, but that marginal cost stays right where it is. So uh, other examples of things like this I give are, are telephone networks, which really aren't all that different from satellite communications networks. The final of those four quadrants are public goods. We often hear public goods, uh, this is probably one of the most misused terms in both economics and public policy. Um, we hear things called public goods when we want to get them for free. Actually, I, I once saw somebody write a blog post saying, uh, the definition of public good seems to be those things that I think I or my preferred constituency, constituency group should be getting for free or reduced cost. <laughs> no. These are things that are neither uh, excludable nor rivalrous. My favorite is health care. Health care is often called a public good. Health care is not a public good. You can close the door and no one else is using that doctor at the same time you are. Um, at the same time, public health is a public good, and that's different. That's herd immunity from vaccinations. That is, um, uh, I'm thinking of a good example here, protections that we're seeing deployed across the country right now against the Zika virus. Uh, these things are public goods because they're not excludable, they're not rivalrous, and they're very closely related, and that's the problem, is we can't look at a single field and say that's a public good or that's a private good. We have to look at individual services and goods across the entire economy. Um, there's also a problem here with uh, free riders. Free riders are people who are like, well, somebody's already providing this service, why should I bother paying for it? Um, and this is a common problem we have with public goods. Um, two other things happen that are very interesting with public goods. One is, let me do these in the order here, negative externalities tend to screw them up. We've heard about the tragedy of the commons, right? This also happens with common pool resources. Once you start dumping, let's say, carbon dioxide, nah, that's a bad example, sulfur dioxide into the air. <laughs> I haven't been woofed at in a while. <laughs> I'm sorry. Sulfur. <laughs> Once you start dumping sulfur dioxide into the atmosphere, you know, I might be getting a benefit from that because I'm producing, you know, electricity and dumping all that sulfur dioxide into the air, right? I'm eating the entire benefit from that. But you're all taking the negative cost of that through acid rain, right? When was the last time you guys heard about acid rain as a problem? Been a while? Like 20 years? You know what happened? Clean Air Act happened? Created a sulfur trading scheme? You know, carbon trading works. Um, this is how we know it works. Um, and <laughs> the other thing is, public goods are usually underproduced when they have to be produced, unless there's some sort of public subsidy for it, because no one's willing to pay for it. So the classic examples of public goods are things like national security. The Army, the Navy, the Air Force, the Marines, Coast Guard, whatever, of the United States are here protecting me. Right? Yes. Can we, th thank you, <laughs> and thank you for not woofing. <laughs> but they, they can't turn that off and not protect you at the same time. 
Um, same thing with knowledge. I know something, and I cannot tell you, but you're gonna, if you find it out, there's nothing I can do about that. Um, lighthouses are, are, are an old example. And, and I like the internet. Now, now, this is where we again find twin examples of things that are very closely related and are get graded differently. The internet itself is a public good. Your connection to it is not. Um, and that's important to understand and draw those distinctions. So that's you know quick review of public economics. So the question becomes, how does this start to work out when we get to Mars? When somebody gets to Mars, I don't think it's going to happen in my lifetime. I forgot to start my timer. Um, <laughs> At Mars, on site, you're going to have basic things that are going to turn, I'm going backwards now through the list. Certain things are going to turn out to be public goods, same kind of things we see here, atmosphere, um, transportation routes, um, law and order security, courts. Their existence will be a public good. <laughs> Using them may not be, but their existence will be. And those are two very closely related things. These things are going to get provided for by government. They're going to be paid for through general taxes. Yep and negative or externalities will have to be monitored. You don't want somebody screwing things up for everyone. <coughs> and when we have club goods, there are gonna be things like entertainment, telecommunications, infrastructure, schools, media. These things are all kind of generally come up together as experiences in a way. And, and I kind of threw that in there as a, as a concept. The whole idea, remember when they say, if you want a happy life, pay for experiences and not things? Club goods are often experiences. Um, provision, marginal cost should be paid for by the consumer. However, <coughs> when it comes to financing the fixed costs, which are often capital costs, but not always, um, you definitely gonna be debt funded. I mean, someone's gonna have to pay interest. That interest, by the way, becomes part of the marginal cost. And in a lot of cases, you're gonna have the government providing those fixed costs. There's certainly places where that will be appropriate. Telecommunications infrastructure, schools, come up as those things where that seems appropriate. Certainly, it's what happens here. Common pool resources are going to be the breathable air, transportation, actual transportation, think about a bus line. Uh, common land, air, water, and power generation. These are things, generation. And remember, this also comes up with the question of once you have a group of people who are operating and living on Mars regularly, power, land, and air generation, are, we don't have to worry about water generation normally. We can just get it right out of the ground here, right? Well, sometimes. No, not, not in Arizona, but you can do it here. Or in you can just drill straight down, huh? Uh, or in Flint. Or in Flint. <laughs> well, that's, that's another set of issues. <laughs> okay, I'm just going to let that go. Uh, and in general, I don't have to produce the air I breathe. We have plants everywhere that deal with that problem for me, right? Those aren't going to be. Those are going to be real issues at Mars. It's going to be very expensive to get water. It's going to be very expensive to get air. Power not so it won't be that substantially different, but it's still something that has to be done. Provision is going to be access restricted. It's going to be licensed. Fees should be related to dam potential damage caused by these things. You've got to use these resources, but you need to limit damage at the same time, so otherwise they go away. And you need that periodic usage cap. Remember when I was talking about sulfur dioxide trading caps working? That's what I'm talking about here. Finally, you got private goods, medical care, food, clothing. What else did I put on that list? Durable goods, your refrigerator, um, that kind of stuff. These are all going to be paid for directly by the consumer. They might require some subsidies depending on the policy needs, right? But the consumer paid for. <laughs> Working with me here. Hmm? I love Fry. <laughs> Shut up and take my money. I, I love this picture. Everybody loves this picture. It turns up on the internet all the time. Um, now, so I've given like a basic review of economics, right? And for some yes. people, I'm sure that's been just review. The question is, why does this really matter? Scarcity is important. Scarcity is what's going to be driving the economic influence on anywhere, whether it's here in the United States, whether it's in Europe, whether it's on Mars or the moon or <laughs> an undiscovered tribe in the jungle of the Amazon. Scarcity and resource limits are the fundamental problem of economics. Scarcity profiles will define <coughs> Excuse me. Different resources have different types of scarcity profiles. And as we've just outlined here, you know, there are four different scarcity profiles. Um, different scarcity profiles lead to different provisioning arrangements. Governments should pay for some things. Clubs should pay for some things. Individuals should pay for some things, depending on how they work. 
I can't get over this point enough here. The future is not going to be a money-free utopia. This is the way it's depicted in Star Trek, right? In fact, if anyone, re if anyone remembers their future history from Star Trek, the first colony off Earth was on Mars and called Utopia Planitia. It's not going to happen that way. <laughs> I mean, it may be called that, but it won't be a money-free utopia. But the other way we often see these sorts of futuristic space colonies depicted is they're hyper-libertarian. Very, very constrained. Oh, well, actually, unconstrained, I guess would be the other way to put it. That doesn't make sense either. If these things made sense on Mars, they would probably make sense somewhere on Earth, and they actually don't make sense somewhere on Earth. Yes, there is a tension we have, especially in the current political environment, between what should be paid for by government and what should be paid for by individuals. <coughs> but no one realistically expects that tension to be resolved completely one way or the other. And this is important that we realize this now because the depictions we see, and I think that these things gel in a lot of our minds, are completely and totally unrealistic. Um, the other problem we have here, since this is the thing I'm not talking about, is ex getting the, exploring space is expensive, right? Building rockets, there's a minimum cost of energy to get something into orbit, and that cost goes up as you want to go further out. But living there's also going to be expensive. There are going to be costs with living on Mars or the moon or in a space station, which we don't realistically deal with here. They are the cost of breathable air, the cost of getting reasonable water, the cost of disposing of, of waste, which are very, very different than we see here. I say here that expanding economies will reduce net cost. That's actually not entirely true. They're not going to reduce net cost. They'll just make it easier to pay for. And what this means is that when you have a Martian colony or a lunar colony or a space station, it has to be able to fund itself through some sort of export. Trade imbalances that favor these colonies will support them in the long term. They don't have to stay that way, but they need to be that way for a long time until they're completely built out and can be self-supporting. <clears throat> these net trade surpluses are going to be very difficult to manage initially. For instance, if let's say there were 100 people on Mars right now today, what could they export that we could possibly need here? Precious gems, Precious gems and some. Precious gems and some. Well, maybe that, but we don't know that that's there either. And, and this goes back to something I said before we got, you know, the four room no, filled up is the best way to get people to go to Mars, to get Congress to fund this, is to tell them there's oil there. <laughs> there's diamonds. I don't care about them. You know, but that's just it. There has to be something somebody there is going to send back and pay for and pay a lot for to make this worthwhile. Well, that's ultimately what may very well happen. Uh, uh, somebody says, send the military first. And I said, that may be what very well what happened. Because, you know, if, if you look at the early exploration of, of, of a lot of places, the military does it first. Tourism works, but I, that's expensive. I mean, I don't have the money to go to, I don't have the money to go to Florida. <laughs> What do you mean? Oh yeah, absolutely. I, I, I know people who've... <coughs> I don't know that that's something you can build a society on, but hey, it's a start. <laughs> um, the political implications of all this are the extreme requirement's going to require substantial countermeasures. These countermeasures are going to be expensive to build and maintain, and these, the energy cost to support that is going to be substantial. Democracies do not like to support unequal populations. I think that that's the lesson we learned from Brexit. That's the lesson we've learned from recent political discussions in this country. It's the lesson we've learned from political discussions in Greece, in Spain, and Italy over the last several years. If there's a, if the <coughs> if there's a high level of inequality in the economy, the higher end of that economy is, the, is not going to be interested in supporting. And we need to figure out how to manage that and see that through and make sure that the broad economy is supporting everyone <laughs> in the long term. And that's frankly true here in the United States, too. So I'm getting, uh, I'm getting hooks of different times thrown at me here. So uh, finally, this is my last slide anyway. Um, looking forward, three things we need to make, uh, keep concerned about. What are the socioeconomic implications of terraforming? You know, what's that going to look like? And also, I think that's, I, as I wrote that, thought about that this morning. That's a great title for a co an edited volume if somebody wants to do that. Um, yeah, there's that too. There's been lots of science fiction on that. 
What are the implications of finding easy to get water? That drives down a lot of these costs. That's also true at Europa, and we'll all find out on Monday what that announcement's about. Um, and what about shared resources between Mars and Earth? Telecommunications is necessarily a shared infrastructure. But what other infrastructure can be shared between the two places Solar and others? Power. Hmm? Solar power. Is that shared or is that just the same? same yeah. I mean, if you could share, if you could find a way to beam power effectively, that'd be great. What about wars? So, I'm sorry? What about wars? Because if we have multiple settlements and they have their own governments, wouldn't they go like, oh, I'm not sharing my food or my atmosphere with you. I would just wait you for, to, for you to die out and then just colonize your place. I, I hate to be the academic who says this, but watch my talk from last year. Okay. So, <laughs> also, this is just a gratuitous bender shot. So. <laughs> Sir, so the uh, economic model that you presented here is very similar to what we use on Earth, and you've made some arguments for why that will be the case. Uh, and. But, but the, the pressures on Mars are obviously going to be far more extreme than in most places here on Earth. There are some notable examples, say, like on a submarine. But in most of those cases, there are people who are highly trained, selected for that task, and have a very clearly defined command structure, like the military. So we can, you talked about the military being the first to colonize Mars, but presumably it will be civilians after that, on the order of 1,000 to 100,000 people in a colony. So how do you deal, like, how do you think that the economies are going to be impacted by the fact that you can just pop a bubble with a needle for the average citizen? I don't know. That, that's <laughs> what made me start thinking about this stuff. I don't know how that works. And a submarine's a really interesting example, or, or I mean, I've never been on a submarine, but while there's an underground economy, it's not really underground, but there's an economy of sorts that's completely isolated there. You know, everyone's getting their paycheck and, and they're not really spending anything that's not already on the ship, right? I mean, this makes sense. I mean, you don't go out and suddenly import the latest PS3 or I don't know what the, I'll play game. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> Thank you. But that's my point. When it comes out today, if you're underwater, you can't suddenly bring that in and pay for it. I mean, the only things that are, are circulating are things that are already there. In a lot of ways, it's like a prison economy. Um, it, there's an isolated economy where goods do not move in very easily are going to be very difficult to work with. And if you go back and look at the way you know, the, Western, the, the, the North American colonies were importing goods on like a six to nine month time lag, um, prior to the United States Revolution, you see the same kind of thing there. Um, that command structure, it's not the command structure that's important, it's the fact that there isn't really anything you need to buy. Everything, every, all your basic essentials are provided for. We have time for one more question. One more question, go ahead. Um, given that Mars will necessarily require a very heavy industry and technologically focused society to people that can live, what do you think is the minimum population for a industrial and self-sufficient colony? That's a great question. I have no idea. I wouldn't even know where to start modeling that. So on Earth, it's about 10 to 100 million people? I don't, I'll trust you on that. It's pretty, pretty high. That's, that's a lot of people. Oh, that, for record, that's, uh, South Korea is the smallest nation that makes Korea's strongest and potential. Yeah, but South Korea is not isolated in, in the same way. I think a more relevant, number, more relevant question is how I see what you're saying. Yeah. Genetically diverse. What do you see, though? I mean, you, 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 you,